Thank you everyone for attending. Everyone has a voice. This is officially our second series of the year. Very exciting. We always promote our youth and a featured poet, which will continue in the interim. Right now, first acknowledgement goes to the Brockton Public Library. Thank you, Melise, for coordinating and assisting us, as well as the director, Paul Engel. We also want to take a moment to thank the Brockton Community Access because it allows people that when they're not able to come, especially under the weather conditions, because it is really cold, uh, to attend, but they're always able to see it. And yourselves that attend and your family members and friends can share the moment that they weren't able to be here physically, but they can watch it on the Brockton Community Access local TV network. We're going to begin our series as we generally do with open mic. I love the fact that people can come and feel the courage and the empowerment and the desire to want to share of articulated arts that they have shared within their families, their friends, or with no one but ready to feel that confidence to share with us. There's always a message in each articulated poem. And ironically, planned and not planned, this is the color red, right? It is Valentine's weekend. <laughs> so I'm going to open it up by saying love. Love, 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 do you love? Internal, external, love. Love, 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 descends like a dove. It is a gift from above. Love, 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 do you love? All righty, our opening love, beloved Valentine family will be Gabrielle Valentine, who's one of our aspired ongoing poet. Welcome. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. This first poem that I'm going to read today is about, is about Brockton. It is called Urban Heaven. Oh, you dear urban heaven, your lovely de delivery train Brown cubed clouds and mostly brown skinned angels bring a light to my heart. Your delightful smells of cultured food, your walls of deep expression, and the way you bring all and the way you bring all together bring all people together sends me pride. Alright. So Up next is, the, is another poem. So lately I've been meditating and um, before I started really getting into that and getting really spiritual, I wrote this poem called, How Will It Be? How will it be when I fully reach you? How will it, will it be as though I'm leaving my own body behind? Or will it feel as though I'm being washed away into the air? What will happen when I'm able to speak with you? Will you sound beautiful and delicate or stern and wise? Will you whisper or shout? How many truths, truths must I confess to you, if at all? How will you look when I finally see you? Will you appear as a Christian angel or as a Japanese goddess? Do you shapeshift at all? Will you blind me with your light? Will, you, will you, your looks teach me a lesson? How will I feel when it's all over? Will I be enlightened by your wisdom? Will I feel haunted by your overall presence? Will you leave me with a message I, I should send to others? Only time will tell. Here's another poem I wrote called Regretting and Waiting. Can't wait till I'm in kindergarten. Can't wait to, to count to 10. Kindergarten comes and goes. Then we're stuck in a boring routine. Oh, I can't wait till middle school. I'll be the most popular. <laughs> I'll be the most popular kid by then. So middle school comes and goes, and we're all shitty to, to each other. Oh, I can't wait for high school. I'll be super big. High school comes and goes, and we're sick of being kids. Just, just wait till I'm in college. I'll be an adult then. College comes and goes and we're all dreading adulthood. I wish I were a kid. Life was easier then. Life comes and life goes, and we breathe in breath, breaths of regret. So this next one is inspired by my sister, but by, by my 
first oldest sister. She's been through a lot in terms of her relationships, and now that I'm older and realize the stuff that I realize, this is a poem around that. Fly again. Once my eldest eagle sister flew away to the zoo with another eagle, so my mother eagle flew to the zookeeper to get my sister back. When she told the zookeeper of her plight, the zookeeper just scoffed and told her, you don't love her as much as you do her other chi your other chicks. It took everything inside of my mother not to scratch the zookeeper to death. The more my oldest sister spent time with her lady eagle, the Taurus, the more, I sp the more time I spent soaring with my second oldest sister. We flew over town, dove deep into the sea, and ate the best fish the best fish together. On one random day, my oldest sister flew back to the mountain between her bits of crying and squawking. She revealed to us that her special lady eagle allegedly needed to join a different zoo. In spite of her heartbreak, she soon flew away to another mountain with a different lady eagle. This lady eagle showed herself to us as protective and strong. One day, however, my eldest sister flew back to the mountain with broken wings. We were unsure if she'd ever fly again at all. Then one day I walked over to see her at the edge of a cliff. She put her two feet closer to the edge, opened her wings, and flew. And with a quick glance in the air she gave me, I knew that even though her wings would never be fully recovered, they weren't permanently damaged. Thank you, Gabrielle. And this is what this open mic is all about. You come up, you read, you come here to express yourself. Because speaking in front of an audience, let alone one or two, can be very intimidating. It can be, it can be nervous wrecking. But this is the place where you're here to articulate and speak and also develop. And Gabrielle is a regular, now I would like to say you are, <laughs> that attends, and she shares her poetry. But when she was speaking in areas of family dynamics and talking about the mother eagle, we have a devil Valentine take. Her mother, Cara Valentine, is soaring because she's come with her little eagle. Welcome, Cara. <laughs> I have never read my poetry in public before, so I'm a little nervous. <laughs> this is, I wrote a couple years ago. Um, Gabrielle not just inspired me to come up tonight, but she's inspired me through her whole life. She is autistic. Um, so this is something that was a conversation between me and my older daughter. And Here's a question. Just when you think you have a clue, it's regarding autism, always wondering if you know what to do. Anger and frustration seem to be a quick reaction. Do you change what you stay, say to stop it by a fraction? Or do you carry on and speak as you normally would with the thought that they will learn to cope like they should? The world can be tough. Not everyone will understand. Was autism put here for us to change? Is that what he had planned? Then the question becomes, is it even about being autistic? Should we be understanding no matter what the characteristic? I know for me, I have a lot to learn, not just with autism itself, but with all be people being a concern. From this moment on, I choose to take this vow, to be loving and understanding to every person here and now. Did I answer my question? Well, yes, I guess I did. It's not about treating the autism, but more about how we treat the kid. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> um, and just one more. Um, never alone. When the sun goes down, the spirits begin to roam. A whisper in your ear, a ghostly feeling throughout the home. The lights give a flicker. Sheets move slowly down the bed. Horror takes over your body, thinking it's all in your head. A black mist appears, the fear keeps you still. A disembodied voice is heard, goosebumps caused by a chill. 
The mist starts to change. A silhouette takes form. Run, run, but nothing happens. Feeling numb and warm. It sits on the bed, crying out for you. Terror takes over. What do I do? What do I do? Then the fear subsides. You look at the face. Something seems familiar. Your heart slows down in pace. The face that you see is a person you have missed, coming back to let you know they really do exist. When you're feeling scared or you're feeling hopeless, stop and remember, stay completely focused. The fear you felt was unjustified, for it clouded the truth that love is multiplied. You are never alone. Someone is always by your side. Whether in spirit or on earth, they will always be your guide. Thank you. Thank you. That was very lovely. And it's, and it's a beautiful written poem because we sometimes forget the diversity includes many unique, beautiful, wonderful people, and that also includes the family of autism. Very nice. Greatly appreciated. All righty. Okay, back to the Valentine. And you know, I am like mixed with Latino, Hispanic, and America. So I am going to tweak this and I'm going to read something in Spanish. So I'm bringing a little sazon, a little flavor. And if we know anything about the Latino culture, and if you've ever watched Telemundo and Univision, we got novelas, and novelas are soap operas. And that is why they always, is like Latinos are full of love. So I am going to read this, and um, all this entails of is just amor means love and an intertwined love, a delusion. There's always a woman and another woman loving the same man. So, here we go. Amor, amor mío, amor suyo. Esperando mi amor. ¿Quién eres tú? ¿Quién eres él? ¿Quién será? Vamos a ver. Por amor, nos peleamos. Por amor, nos destruyamos. Por amor, no sabemos amar. Amor mío, amor suyo. Esperando mi amor. And she will always wait because he's loving too many people. <laughs> Alrighty, and now I have the pleasure of calling Jason Wright, who actually was our featured poet last month, who continues to be dedicated and faithful to everyone who has a voice. He's going to come up, give a little brief up of himself, but continue to share the wonderful poems he writes and inspires many, and also embraces the field as we stated diversity and acknowledging humanity, the areas of challenged behaviors, which is the mind, mental health. Very supportive in many communities. Welcome, Jason. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Wright. Um, I am the editor of Oddball Magazine. Uh, it's oddballmagazine.com. We're a poetry collective. Um, we're poetry and art, and uh, we do talk a lot about advocacy. Some of the stuff we talk about is mental health. Some of the stuff we talk about is politics. Some of the stuff we talk about is uh, love. Uh, whatever. Poetry is art, right? Poetry inspires. So we put inspiring poetry up uh, every day. Uh, we have multiple columnists. Um, and check us out, oddballmagazine.com. And uh, you can also get merch there that I am wearing currently. Because uh, why not wear your own stuff, you know? That's how I look at it. Anyway, um, I have three poems. One is called Threes. That's the, the most recent poem I've written lately. Um, kind of a thing about a number three. It's a very cool number to me. Uh, good things come in threes. Bad things come in threes. But anyway, this one is called uh, Threes. So, Jack Thought 306, number three. A three is a deep thinker. So if anyone says you are a three, say thank you. If I call you a three, know you mean something to this world, or at least to me, you are a three. A three doesn't take no. A three challenges the status quo. A three is a poet. A three is a man, woman, or being who sees without seeing, frees minds that need freeing, has ink in its veins and heartbeats and meter, makes the mood improve just by being there. Threes show style in the clothes they wear, read books with beautiful endings, want to make the world move with their message, want to cure the world of depression, teach their truth, each lesson learned. Threes turn the page. 
Wow, the three is. A whiz and biz, the three is. A mild man reported by daylight fighting crime at twilight. That's what threes do. A three is a work in progress, a world travel debonair maker of something, stirring up the conscious like loose leaf tea. A three is a beautiful thing to be. I am a three. Anyone reading this, you are a three. You will make magic just be existing. Everything a three does pays off with persistence. Threes think different without apology. I will never be number one, but I will always be a three. So, depending on the internet, and if this, oh, we have good internet here, um, I'm going to read a, a poem uh, that goes back to, uh, the little preface of the poem, it goes back to 1995 when I walked into a doctor's office and my life was forever changed. So here we go. The day I was Ritalind, Jagged Thought 146. In the dark, we were all cast ghosts and villains, sad or plastic. We were all donations to this world. We were all just silence. We were all just stains. Just another jagged thought by Jason. I scribble these words into my notebook, lost in a lecture. The blue ink on my skin matches the blue ink on my desk. I've started to draw threes everywhere. I don't know why yet. My back sinks against the cold metal chair, feet fidget against the checkered floor. I sit silent, watch as Miss Modine scratches out equations. I miss most of it, just don't understand it. Bill sits next to me, he's a dick and is zoning out next to me. I hate him so much. I was never meant to be like this. I get lost back in my words as the X's and Y's fly by my head. I try but I don't get it. Maybe I'm not trying hard enough. Stop writing, pay attention. If only there was something that could get me to pay attention. I don't realize it then, but that very moment will define my life. My dad says he wants me to see a doctor after school. I think, yes, a pill. That'll make me better. And the last poem I'll read is from my first book, and it's called Singing Songs of Solitaire at Scusset Beach. And this has to do with, uh, I don't know if anyone knows what a manic episode is, but it was uh, a very strong uh, feeling of nirvana that came over my body when I was in 1999, which ended up being called bipolar disorder. So it's called Singing Songs of Solitaire at Scusset Beach. Everyone has their eyes closed on this train. Oh, and I wrote it on the red line in 2012. Not so sunny of a day. <clears throat> Singing songs of solitaire at Scusset Beach. Everyone has their eyes closed on this train. I have my eyes open praying for the rain to end and bring sunshine around again. Sunshine reminds me of Scusset Beach, an early morning retreat just over the Bourne Bridge. The long jetty was always pronounced Jedi to me, those waves. The waves overwhelm me with laughter and later overwhelming sadness. The joy of knowing that there will never be a never after. And when you walk on that sand blessed by the summer sun, nothing matters. The joy of knowing the water never stops. It bathes the coast with bright blues and greens. The curl of the waves, the sound of waves crashing, receding, and returning to the shoreline. I look back at those times with a happy heart. I visited Scusset many times, being young, growing up, lost in songs. One time I brought my manic bride to the edge of the water in the summer night. She left me alone playing a song about how she could always make me smile. Scusset was a stage of my endless summer and boredom. The heat of summer nights left me the desire to visit there more often, alone with a guitar and a deck of cards, playing songs in solitaire at the same time. Writing down with feverish quickness, each page filled with ink, the thoughts came so quick I thought I was brilliant, never thought I was sick. I haven't been back to visit Scusset Beach in all its awesomeness. One thing I know true, the ocean always gives back whatever love you give to it. And in its massiveness, it will never desert you. It will never be the cause of constant memories. It will always be the cause of constant memories. Writing about the summer sea and the sunshine, killing time on the red line, listening to the kinks. You are a misfit, just like me. And we are all strangers on the same road. All right, so uh, if you guys uh, are interested in uh, oddballmagazine.com and you want to be a part of it, um, also we're doing another cool thing in Norwood, uh, Norwood, Massachusetts, on February 24th. Uh, we're having a, a nice uh, poetry reading. It's an open mic. Um, 
all skills welcome. Uh, it's Oddball Magazine Presents at the Nord Public Library in the Simone Room on February 24th at 6 o'clock. Thanks. Thank you, Jason, and thank you for sharing that additional information. And we're going to continue on with our open mic, and I'm kind of excited for this one because my, um, I'm also inspired in the city of Brockton. I wear many hats, do many things. I've also established an association called DINA, Diverse Initiatives Neighborhood Association. But I'm also engaged with many individuals, like the individual I'm about to call for his poem. Yes, I'm looking at you. And it is important to share that because we've come together, known of each other, and just engaging with city meetings, community meetings, but the same passion. The passion of understanding the importance of being a voice for your people. And not, it's not a racial statement, it's not any particular statement, but what is a statement is, is that we all come from different cultures, different backgrounds, education, financials, etc. But the importance is being able to come together collaboratively, unite, share the love, and share the message. So now I would like to welcome George Brickhouse, which we call him, <laughs> because he is, to come and share his poetry. Welcome. Wow, this is a blessing to be able to come and to go with uh, the spoken word. I don't have anything per se written that I roll from. This affords me the opportunity to move forward with some ideas in my mind that I've been bouncing around. And uh, as Ali said, I'm uh, blessed once again to be part of a group of people that have taken the time, or make the time, to come out and to <laughs> try to get together, to be one. We have different ideas, we come from different backgrounds, and uh, I'm a little bit tied up because of the support that's given to me and to us. Uh, brother who just came in to the room who's at the back. Jonathan is the head of Block uh, Security, which is a program in Brockton that is moving forward in terms of providing help and security and different functions in Brockton, not just in businesses, but in community events. And the fact that, uh, as I said, he comes out to support in Josh who came in with a plate of food first but uh, that's Josh <laughs> oh man and uh, this young lady was the love of my life at one time but uh, you know no 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 she was <laughs> she said uh, if you read more then you'll see me more <laughs> so it got to like a book a week, and sometimes I wouldn't even finish it. I just bring it back, just say, boom, I got another book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have two pieces that I like to share with you. And what uh, this does for me, it enables me later to take a look on the, the community access network, to see it, maybe to develop it more, and to bring it back as a written piece. But it enables me to, <laughs> as a friend of mine used to say, you free your ass and your mind will follow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the first one is make, Amer make America great again. That's what he said. He said that, and I said, gee whiz, let me take that and go to bed. But I said, if we make America great again, what does it really mean? Does he mean what he's saying? Or is it just something mean? So as he began to show me, what he really meant was not America at all. Because he was saying, damn, you done toiled in cotton fields, but you haven't done enough. You've tried to come over from across the border, but I won't let you in. Gee whiz, Red, we got rid of you when we took your land. We killed all your buffalo. We took 
all your man's brown, black, pink, yellow, green, and white. If you all get together, then you really will make a fight. Mm -hmm. But what I'm going to do is keep you divided and keep telling you some of you are free. Some of you are free because you want to be like me. I got 40% of the country, so I say. I got 40% to make y'all do what y'all do today. You know, y'all came out and voted when a black man rose to the top. But you didn't keep in mind, it's every two years you need to vote to make shit stop. If you want to change laws and you want other people in the senates and places that make the rules, then it's every two years you got to come out. You can't sit at home and watch network, not Netflix. And what I did to top it off, no, I didn't make liquor enough. I gave you weed that you could take and puff. So you can go now to the local store and get one and twist up and take it home. You can sit and watch Netflix and let your mind roam. The second one is a uh, conflict in my community. How did it get here, this conflict in my community? Hmm, damn. They say that when the brothers came back from Nam, they brought it back. It wasn't enough for them to bring it back. So that's what they said. They brought it back and they started that flow. The next thing you know, heroin's in the community too. But it wasn't enough brothers coming back from Nam with enough big enough bags to bring it back. But that's what they said. And next thing, it's crack in the community too. Damn, all this started with brothers coming back from the NAM, bringing it back. We didn't have big enough bags to bring it back, but it got in the community anyway. It got in all the communities. And once it got in there, it made it wrong. And in some places it made it right. But once it got out of our community, that's when the government wanted to start a fight. But as long as it was in that community, it was okay, because it stayed there. They died day by day. We didn't mind. And then they said crack cocaine. Oh, shit. It didn't upgrade it to something new. But it's still in the community. It's okay, as long as it don't reach out to you. But once it gets outside the community, that's when we start to rave. And now, they say, oh my goodness, it's the pills that have made them right. Damn, keep them pills in the community. It's okay. They won't get uptight. Oh, but shit, it's out of the community. Now it's a nationwide epidemic we must do. We must put money forth, and we must try to do something that will help you. So what we need to do is a community is come together and see what's wrong. And when we do, we need to say something. Because as a community, white, yellow, black, red, and green, and pink too. We're okay as long as we're a community and we do what we need to do. Thank you, George. And it was perfect timing because the month of February, as we acknowledge in statewide cross country is considered Black History Month. And it's very important to embrace those who want to share and continue to remind as much as we've come along in this country, residual effects are real. There's a history behind each aspect and each entity that leads us to where we're at today. We are struggling, we're trying to work together in what I see in this country that this 2020 year should be about healing it should be about unity and embraces each other's diversity and supporting as long as we all consider the reason why we say no or even think of a wall is only the imaginary one that says,
we will collaboratively, creatively think on how to heal our country with the continued mental health services, the continued educational services, but opening doors and articulate, and we are rising in the city of Brockton. Block Security, thank you, JP, for coming. Uh, Philip Asaurus with his creative arts and why we're here today, Brockton Public Library supports many entities that come through here for workshops and awareness and even offers individuals like myself to say, hey, we want a workshop. Melise is always ready and open to coordinate and support. So isn't Paul Engel, the director. We have many aspects of our entities that come. We even proactively opened a town hall segment at the spot outside of the normal facilities. If after hours people want to come and meet, every Wednesday we're there uh, from generally from 8 until 9, and we respect each other's time. As well as I am proud to say that we're hosting our first President's Day leadership pilot conference on Monday, and, um, and we're moving forward to continue to build from youth to adults, to the elderly, of all diverse entities. We're here to bring the change and the diversity, but it can only be done in a united manner. Now we're gonna go forward, and um, it's a pleasure. Beverly is dedicated, very faithful. She attends all of our monthly uh, Everyone, Has a, Everyone Has a Voice series, and she shares her poetry, and she's even an author as well. Beverly, welcome. Hello, hello, hello. Good to see you all again. Happy New Year because I wasn't here before. I'm quite long-winded, so um, work with me a little bit here. I have 169 poems. I won't read them all today. <laughs> and it's um, just great to be around all these uh, great people and poets, so we're going to get right to it. Oh, first of all, number one. Um, this is my great book, Inspirations to See You Through. I won't be sharing any poetry from it today, but you are quite welcome to check it out because it is over there in the library. Okay, um, we're going to start. I have three. Make it really quick. Um, I thought this would be good to read. I didn't write it, but it was very interesting to me. Um, this is by uh, Portia Nelson, and it's called The Whole. It's five uh, short chapters, and it goes like this. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I am in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. I walk down another street. <clears throat> Okay, now this one is definitely written by me. Okay, this one's called Watching Over You. You want someone to hear you. You want someone to care. Hello, is anyone listening? Is anyone even there? You open your mouth to scream, but no sound comes out. What's going on? What is this all about? You know that you can make it. You're using your coping skills but it feels like molasses going uphill. You wonder and you wonder, then you wonder some more. You're stronger than you think, just step through that door. The door to opportunities, the door to so much hope. Go ahead, you got it. Yes, you can cope. Well, I feel better, though I'm not exactly fine, but writing is my outlet and it works all the time. Yes, someone hears you and yes, someone cares. God is watching over you, and yes, he answers prayers. Thank you. Um, a lot of my peers were asking me, um, I had to write something new for 2020, so I tried, and um, this is what happened. February the 5th, I wrote this of uh, this year, and it says, don't let go of your dreams. You listen to the wind, 
whistle through the rain. You hope your dreams don't trickle down the drain. Your bills are paid, but you wonder about the money. Are you guilty of sin like a bear stealing honey? Are your dreams disappearing into thin air? You wonder and wonder, is this even fair? Okay, now here's a clue, because you seem like you don't know what to do. If you mope through your pain, you'll continue to feel dreary. Okay, you got this, and I know you can hear me. Hear me. So begin to think in a different way. Try something new you can start today. Maybe you can grow your own garden and don't stop now because you're just getting started. I've told you a thousand times before, don't be afraid to step through that door because at first it may be scary. Just take one step at a time. Don't look back and keep a made up mind. So don't do your failures as falling rain. It's just a slight interruption, not a permanent pain. Keep moving forward. Stop dwelling on sorrow. You made it through today, and you'll make it through tomorrow. So if your way seems cloudy, and there's no one left on your team, there still isn't a reason to give up on your dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. And we shall tarry along. Of course, you know, I love my interval poems. Haikus are the easiest shortcut out. Or sometimes just a small little message through a small little poem. Diversity, unity represents love. Red, white, and blue, which one are you? I am none. I am yellow, green, orange, and purple. I am the colors of the rainbow, which represents love. All righty, now it's a pleasure to invite Anita Olet, and I would love for you to come and share your poetry. Welcome. Thank you. It is just so nice to be here. My husband and I are just moving to Middleborough, so we're very unfamiliar with the whole area, but I'm just so happy to be here. I'd like to read one poem that I did write for my husband, for Bob, on a birthday a while ago. Um, we have been a lot of places, but we've been there together. So this is a poem about that. When storms appear and caves become the driest place and sitting in an ancient beehive hut brings ease, when canyon walls cast shadows on the river rocks and cupping hands beneath a waterfall releases thirst, when ghosts reveal themselves in broken earthenware, and bending backward shows you cobalt skies and cactus thorns. When flowers group themselves in natural bouquets, and forlorn feeling places reappear in sunlight. When meadowlarks come back to nest on Midwest prairies, and spiders are as yellow as the buttercups they walk on, when remembered cellos and pianos have arrived, and music brings you right to meadows, moors, and mesas. When inchworms match the blades of grass they sway with, and deer are safely hidden just beyond the tree line, then we need nothing else as you and I stay blessed by breathing color-saturated air with all. Thanks. continue on. I'm excited uh, to say that what I love about the fact that we don't always plan who's going to come except we know that the features are going to be here. And then we have spontaneity that takes place. That kind of the way that I see, I'm an energy person, so the way that I see this in a beautiful dynamic, it's Valentine's weekend. We have the Valentine family that came together, yes. And then we also have a preview before our feature, which is the mother of our feature, Lola. Lola's mother is going to come up, and I encourage you, and I'm excited because you just was like, is it open mic? Ya tu sabe, open mic is ready. Atalia Bennett, welcome. <clears throat> so 
So this was totally spontaneous. Um, but Gabrielle was playing a little word game. Um, word search, it's called. And it's my husband and I's favorite game. So poetry, it's all about words. It's all about feelings, emotions, and putting things together. So a long time ago, like 10 years ago, I wrote this poem. And it is Valentine's weekend. Uh, but this is a poem about the passion of heartbreak. And it is called, I Lied. I lied. I lied about not remembering you. I lied about not needing you or wanting you. I lied about not feeling sorrow after losing you, no longer being with you or even missing you. Not only did I lie, I no longer loving you, but I also lied about not loving another. You see, my smile is no longer complete, no longer real. There is no yearning for more. The sheets are now cold, and I find myself sleeping on the wrong side of the bed in search for what there is no longer. I'm lost in an endless open sea, swimming for your comfort, for your shelter. It's dark. It's cold, and I am scared. Where are you? Why haven't you rescued me? But now, the nights are calculated, orchestrated, but not in symphony, like that old sound of our melody when we were in tune, a rhythm. How lovely, how soft, how gentle. The music is now loud. The composer shut off because I can't bear it anymore. Today is a lot. I go to sleep and I wake up to another lot. Thank There are many functions to love. That's what makes love interesting. And great stories come out of it, life experiences. And with heartbreak, we hope that one can also come out of it. I want to continue forward. And um, our last open mic at this time, it's heartwarming. I love her tone of voice. It's very comforting. Sheila Twyman is also a regular of Everyone Has a Voice support in poetry and the creative arts. Welcome, please. Cavendish cherry blend, packs it firm and 
that one likes it. Then sucks the heat of the air until the tobacco burns evenly. And its rich, dark flavor slides onto his tongue. He squints the haze, that pungent insect spiraling through the house, beyond clouds and ozone and Sagittarius, to his God who blesses him with such peace. He catches my mother's eye, and she warms him with a smile, sweeter than a bucket full of big cherries, fresh from the tree. Fist and heart pound, the only 
eye contact made was with the glove and the tops of feet. And the emptiness was marked between the lines, swearing to everyone and anyone who would listen. Then I heard someone say, get him next time. I'm feeling kind of stupid. Now I just kind of shuffled my way. Stretching that inch that felt like a mile, finding a surprise, had it all the way. Six, four, three, let's get to, let's play to. Swinging my arms with ease, just like Shoeless Joe, the Sultan of Swan, Jolton Joe. Say hey, kid, the splendid splinter, Hammer and Hank, Bulldog Jablonski, toiled in the minors for too many years, crushing a thousand fastballs, dying by the curb. They tell me this is where legends begin, and they still whisper his name. Bottom of the six, score and wills tied up, bases juiced, three balls, two strikes, two out, breath held, eyes wide, nine against one. Just how it was supposed to be. I didn't walk, didn't run. I just kind of eased my way.
So welcome back, everyone, and uh, we're going to start our features. So our first feature is our uh, student, Lola Bennett, from the New Hutch Charter School. I met Lola last year at the Boys and Girls Club, and she shared her poetry with me, and I knew right away that we had a future poet um, and invited her last year to um, be the uh, feature student poet, and again, I am so humbled and happy that she's come back, and we're going to hear from Lola Bennett. Um, she loves to write because it makes her feel free. She can write something she has never done before or that doesn't exist. When Lola writes, no rules apply. Please welcome Lola Bennett. poems. This first one is from last year, I believe. I did it as a class assignment. We had to pick a color and write a poem off of it. I will say I went a little bit out of the box for the assignment because it is a little bit long, but it's called Blue. The color blue is very deep, but makes people want to weep. It is calm like an ocean or electric like a potion. I am jealous of the color blue. I am jealous of the sky with its bluish hue. I wish to be a flower, a delicate forget-me-not, or a beautiful dress filled with polka dots. Like the color blue, I can be mixed, swirled and twirled, without tools I can't be fixed. Hot like blue flames. However, I can never be tamed, for I am stuck in this blue chair with a forced stare at a whiteboard. Staring at it makes me bored. Sitting here makes me wish that I were a little fish swimming in a big sea big blue sea, or a bird flying higher than the eye can see, or I could be royalty. The color blue has loyalty. I am waiting for someone who will spoil me, to treat me like I am the only thing they see. In this sea of blue crocodile tears, losing this color is something I fear. Without blue, emotion can't be true. There is too much loss without the color blue. And it is Valentine's Day weekend, so I'm, my second one is called Crush. And if the name doesn't explain it. Roses are red, violets are blue. No one prepares you for what love will do. You trip head first when you first meet. This person's not just another bag of meat. They say they care as they watch you smile and play with your hair till they don't. And suddenly you're no longer afloat. Your boat sunk by a tidal wave of feelings you thought they had craved. A crush is a crush because you could get crushed. So you learn to keep your feelings hushed until they disappear. But the words forever ringing in your ears, the fantasies and thoughts never truly lost, just covered by a coat of frost. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. Another round of applause for Lola. 
So now it is my pleasure to introduce Nancy Brady Cunningham. Nancy Brady Cunningham is the author of four books of nonfiction and is a published poet. She also co-edited with Jack Scully the Book of Arrows by poet Mike Amato. She has won both the Barbara Bradley and Gretchen Warren Awards from the New England Poetry Club. Thirteen of her poems were included in Unlocking the Poem by Autone M. Riccio and Ellen Beth Siegel. Nancy and drummer Mike Moran formed the poetry and percussion duo and perform in southeastern Massachusetts. She is a student of yoga and has taught yoga and meditation classes for decades. Also, many years ago, she was the host of the Blackthorn Tavern. It was a monthly poetry series. And if it wasn't for that series, I would not be here today because Nancy gave me my first feature. She saw something in me and invited me to uh, be a feature at her venue. So it is my pleasure to introduce Nancy Brady Cunningham. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today, and uh, thanks to Phil for being my feature when I needed you. And then we both did features together for um, at different venues. So. I also wanted to thank the library. Paul's not here, but um, thank you, library, for <laughs> having us here. It's great. So um, this is my book, and I'm not going to read from the book, because it's so confusing going back and forth. But I happened to bring just a couple of copies with me. So they're over there if you're interested. OK, so the book is entitled Thread of Fire, and it's poetry of peril, longing, and loss. I thought I would write about things that people feel. Everyone is afraid or desires something they don't have or loses someone. So those are the themes. First is a poem about my being lost in the Maine woods with a woman friend of mine. So it's called Lookout. We climbed the long gravel road to the summit of Mount Pisgah and then clamber up wooden stairs, seven flights up to the fire tower that crowns the small mountain. Lakes and forests shimmer below. They beckon us this August morning. We strike out against routine. We forego retracing the road. We plunge into thick woods. We start down the steep backside of Mount Pisgah, looking for blue paint on tree trunks, symbols of the blueberry trail. It will lead to the lot 
where our cars wait. We find no blue marked trees. The slope at last flattens out and we stumble onto a trail. Must be the blueberry. Beguiled by thick pine scent, by sun-spangled forest floor, by mushrooms in a dozen shades, Judy and I sink into the magic of our walk in the wilderness. We never glance back. Never observe the shape of boulders. Never notice when the path widens. Never ponder the lack of hikers. We come upon crude signs. We come upon crude signs where hand-painted arrows point toward distant towns. We're lost in the wrong season. Our wild hearts have blundered onto a snowmobile trail. We backtrack and switch paths, unaware of the circle we're forming till the mountain seems to rise from its center. We begin a steep, sweaty climb up the mountainside, breath heaving. We reach the top and discover no fire tower, no access road, no parking lot, no car. Thick canopy obscures all chance of orientation. We've fallen off the map. If only we could fly west, hold fast to afternoon light, arrive home before dark, we dial 911. In the elasticity of time, we stretch toward rescue. And the next is um, called Riptide Afternoon, Peril for My son, uh, who had gone to the beach that day with his wife and two small children. Riptide afternoon. The way gravity attracts all bodies toward the center, an August swelter <coughs> drew his family to Goose Green. The wife and children slept like folded towels on a blanket. The girl blonde to match the sand, the boy's eyes green as sea glass. The man bra grabs his bodyboard, plows into shallow water. Ocean swells tempt him deeper until a rogue wave dumps him. He focuses his salt stung eyes in time to see his body board caught in the belly of a roller washing toward shore. He clips his pen at attempts to keep parallel while a giant vacuum drags him out to sea. Waves swamp him a second time. He tires, tries treading, 
On shore, his wife shields her eyes, sees his boy sloshing at her feet. He spots a surfer paddling nearby, ready to climb up on his surfboard. Desperate, the man burns through the black of the sea to his voice. He hollers. Wind snares his words, waves slice away meaning. The surfer begins to bore, then casually turns. Did you say something? The man in animal exhaustion gestures for help. The surfer paddles toward him, sees the man's eyes, offers his board, and swims beside the prostate form all the way to waist high water. The man sloshes in, staggers up on the beach. He collapses on a tiny square of refuge, sinking now into warm sand and embraces. They lie there till the sun slides behind the dunes. Time to go home. But that night, over and over, he drifts off, slips beneath the gasp of seawater lungs, and can't touch bottom. He panics, eyes swim open. His stare sees only the underside of waves, all air and attic away. Um, I think loss of um, 
family and friends very difficult. So this is about mourning. And what happens to those left behind? Mourning. They buried your body, but what remains visits me still. A stab of inspiration, an ache of scattered words, a stain of beauty. Then you glide close, insistent through the fog. I long to follow like a shared land. And the next is a poem for Dolores Riccio. Um, Dolores had a workshop, online workshop, and a poetry workshop at and so um, she's been dead almost three years, and she was a wonderful friend. She was a mentor to me, and uh, she was an author of 22 books plus uh, four books of poetry. So white. A wonderful writer and poet. <clears throat> so this is for her. Summerland Roses for Dolores Ruscio. I open the night window, face the empty east, touch flame against wick, scent of oranges spiked with ginger. I light a candle. This oil of tranquility speaks the essence of a peace I cannot find. The candle's label reads Mountain Temple, but on what lost mountain, in which far temple are you hiding? If I am quieter, more interior, does my silence pull you toward me? If I puff out my chest and inhale deeply, will there be room in my lungs for you to breathe to. If I press folded hands over my heart, will you enter a rose sipping water from a thin glass jar? And This is a poem for a dear friend of mine who passed from breast cancer um, over 30 years ago, but grieving just goes on. It's, um, it's still there in your heart. Grieving the second year. <coughs> Flowers choked your coffin, it's early spring. You've left me bound to winter. Barefoot in snow drifts, my body a windshield tree. I watch hundreds of days vanish. Dishes and dusting intrude on our intimate chats. Twelve months, you were the one passenger in my car. 
my only companion when the shower unleashed its tears. The garage needs cleaning, a cold slap against the cheek of reverie. My heart's out of rhythm. How can I revive you? I pray. Where is the ragged fog, the haunted memories? I've entered a wilderness where the mundane ambushes my mind, forces me into neglect. I'm greedy for grief and all its unknowns. I'm losing you. And um, these next couple of poems are about our teenage years. So the first one is called Rising, and I've used the myth of Demeter and Hades and Persephone to talk about a modern 14-year-old. Rising. She takes her hand as they cross, chooses the flowers they pick at the market, forbids even ear ears. Daughter shrinks from her slow, heavy step while flowers weigh down the swinging hips of almost 14. He watches her skinny legs long to skip over the edge of the world. In a black, shiny limo, snorting horsepower, he glides up the dirt road, sipping a pomegranate cosmopolitan in the back seat. He lowers tinted glass, offers her a sip. Won't you come in out of the glare? His gold chains outshine the sun. Shrugging out of a shiver, Persephone slides into cool, dark leather seats. Sinking deeply, his ashen fingers leave their impression on her bare. And the last poem is about um, growing up. I um, lived for my teenage, early teenage years in a housing project in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. We lived near the Narragansett Racetrack. This was such an attraction to teenagers because we couldn't get in without being with someone 18 or older. My parents would say, no boys, no cars, and no track. So where do you figure I went? <laughs> Playing the horses, first in country. Back door closes and closes. March wind blusters against asphalt. He keeps his motor running at the edge of the heights. She spots his powder blue Ford 
continental kit shining on lower rear chassis. He leans across, pushes the door wide. She slides into Heartbreak Hotel, smoldering from the dash. No boys, no cars, no track beats a counter rhythm in her mind. At the red light, she slouches down, a gaggle of girls from her grave, keeps within the crosswalk lines, straight as the nuns at St. Teresa's. He's off to slap 20 on a hot one, shouldering into the shiftless crush, waving greasy bills yelling at the cigar-chewing cashier. Her sideways glances search for wavy-brimmed hats on the ladies, paisley ascots on the men, jubilant roses strung together in the necklace, winner take Afternoon light diminishes. Racing forms litter the ground. He keels out onto Route 1, exhausting her MGM dreams. The project moves. Red brick sameness glowering in the setting sun. Again, he parks on the outskirts. Center back Velva closes in. Lips skim hers. Heat lightning flashes beneath her flared skirt. Her insides twist this way only when she sits close to Paladin. His Friday night kisses blazing through the black and white TV, touching her secret place where smell of blood fear now mingles with steamy car windows. No half gun will travel here. Only one hand reaching for the cold metal handle. He murmurs, stay, tugs at her coat. His sweet hurricane kisses press against supper, dark, home. She leans away, door opens out. She takes the slow, long road. She burns through the icy wind.
Um, my name is Lola Bennett, and I'm from Brockton. Okay, cool. And you just read here at the Every, Everyone Has a Voice series at Brockton Library. How was it? Yes, it was very fun and inspirational. Yeah? Yeah. So when did you first realize you wanted to be a writer? Um, it started a few years ago at the Boys and Girls Club. I participated in a girls group, and we used to write little notes and poems and put them in a box, and they would be read anonymously. Uh -huh. And it just gave me a lot of inspiration to write, and when Philip came to the Boys and Girls Club and was showing, I just wanted to show my work, and he thought it was really good and invited me here. Cool. Yeah. So uh, who are some of your favorite writers? Um, why don't we just play? Or musicians. Musicians? I... Musicians, yeah. because music is poetry yeah. in my mind. So. I really okay. like Lynn manuel Manuel Miranda, I think Oh, it is. from uh, Hampton. Uh, yeah, I listen to a lot of musicals and like raps and I like all them. different kinds of music, but he's one of my favorites. Definitely, yeah. Hamilton's very pretty pretty cool. It's poetry and it's spoken word and it's, it's a musical. Very cool. It's awesome. Very cool. Uh, so what's your family thinking of writing? Um, my family is very supportive of my writing. Yeah. They definitely are interested in it a lot. My The poem Blue that I read is actually one of my mom's favorites that I've written. Mm -hmm. The poem that you read, Blue, that was, a, that was one of the longer poems that you read. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when, when you wrote that? Um, I wrote it for an eighth grade assignment. We were supposed to pick a color and write a poem about it. And I decided to keep it because it was a little bit longer. Well, a lot, there's nothing wrong with long poems. So when they get long, I just call them prose. <laughs> you know, I just call them prose. They have a whole thing. The, 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 the Iliad, right? One of the longest poems oh, ever. Yeah. It's like 10,000 pages. I'm not saying it's 10,000 pages. Is that I'm the saying one about the Greek gods? I believe so. Yeah. yeah I, 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 one I, of my I, teachers had it in her class. I yeah, remember. yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's considered a poem, but it's a very long. It's so long. It's long. <laughs> All right, so what's the most surprising thing you learned about yourself because you wrote, because you were writing poetry? The most surprising thing I've learned about myself while writing poetry is that um, I can use my vocabulary to like explain different things. Like when I'm writing about poetry and I say something, like a metaphor, when you say something but you mean something else completely, sure. I found ways that I can like express myself through that mm -hmm. and I just find it very fun and a creative way to like really stress and that might and all a lot of people that are my age now like are like oh you'd write poetry that's fun but like I find it very fun and relaxing and it's something that I want to be a part of my life. So uh, I started writing poetry uh, during math class. Oh, I write. <laughs> Yeah, so I wasn't reading about equations and stuff. I was writing poetry, and I used to do that. That's how I started. So um, I, you know, I wrote poetry since I was 15 years old. How old are you? I'm 14. 14, so I've been writing since I was 15. So you're on the path. You're going to keep writing? Of course. Yeah, definitely. Um, are you on uh, social media? How does that affect your writing? Yes, I'm on social media. And I think it does affect my writing a lot because there are a lot of kids who are just like, as a teenager, we go through so many emotions, and it's just like, not everything is as it seems. So I feel like that has to do a lot with poetry because you could start a poetry, a poem, something like happy and exciting, and it just turns out that it's sad or the other way around and vice yeah. versa. Yeah, and the cool thing about poetry uh, online is that it, it, it can touch a lot of people, right? So if you write something, that you you know you feel it might someone else might feel it too at the same time. It's one of the cool things about um, social media and poetry. Definitely, you could always do an Instagram post and become an influencer in a day. Yeah, there's also a lot of inspiration. A lot of that inspiration, though. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, has your idea of poetry changed since you began writing? It definitely has changed a lot. Because I just remember like being younger when you first read poetry, you're like, oh, everything's lovey-dovey or sad and depressing and yeah. sounds looks boring. You don't yes. want to do anything about it. And then I actually tried it and it was just fun to like use a different wordplay and find out like things you could actually write about. Well, I got to say that that poem Blue is pretty good. It's a good poem. It's a, it's a good poem. So, all right, if you could pass along one piece of advice uh, for young writers who are like you, uh, who are writing poetry, what would it be? It would be to, like, 
give everything you write about a chance, even if your friends or whatever, anybody says that, oh, that sounds weird or that doesn't look cool or whatever, just do it. Doesn't matter, it could be about anything, just give any topic or subject a chance. Do you know who Tupac Shakur is? I don't think You so. don't know? Okay, uh, Tupac Shakur was, uh, he was a, write, a writer, a writer from, um, he wrote a book called The Rose Grows from Concrete. Oh. Right, and then he ended up becoming one of the best hip hop artists of all time. Yeah, I thought yeah. you said something else. Yeah, Tupac, yeah, of course, right. So, like, he started off as poetry. Talib Kweli started off with, with slam poetry and stuff, and these guys became these really great uh, writers. But there's, but there's so many, you know, all these musicians, all the, the poetry and, and the lyrics that come from uh, poets, Bob Dylan and these guys. Bob, Bob Dylan, sorry, older, older guy. Way older. We're talking like 60s. Uh, dad, mom, music, beat, yeah. beat poet. Would you say grandma music? No, I said dad, mom, music. Dad, mom, music? Oh, maybe not. Grandma music, dad, mom, music. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, the Beatles, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all, uh, it's all, it's all poetry. Even, uh, even what these guys are doing now, today. It's just plus a beat. Plus a beat, right, right, right. right. Um, so, you know, thank you for coming to this event. Uh, are you going to continue writing? And um, what's next for you? Um, I definitely want to continue to write more and come to more Everyone Has Voices, yeah. whether it's open mic or teacher. Yeah, great. Well, um, thanks again for being um, part of uh, Everyone Has a Voice. And uh, everybody check out um, you know, what you got going on. If you want to give any of your shout outs or anything like that, or Shout out anybody, people home in town. My mom. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Everybody. Yes. Um, and definitely the other poets who came up here for the open mic and great. the other feature. Great, great. Sure. All right. Congratulations. You see. definitely have to check out your website. Yes, keep on reading. Right. Everybody is so on reading and congratulating all the poets who just read. So uh, it's good to get a moment to talk to the
Was it, was it Sappho teaching you? She's a big one. <laughs> no, she didn't. No, no, no. Is it a first name, last name? It's your only name. Sappho, yeah. yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she was ancient, please. Like Oprah. Like, like Oprah, right. <laughs> she has <laughs> one name, Sappho. Sappho. And how was that? How was that? Was that a great uh, experience? Probably one of the best. That's awesome. So, did we ask you what your biggest influences and inspires you are in? Well, Sappho, her writing is contemporary. Yeah, if you good. were to read it, mm -hmm. it would fit in with your life. You, you wouldn't know thousands of years. Ago. So that's Sappho, so that's one. Right. Two more influences on your writing. Um, probably this so hard to pick, but... I love Ruby. Oh, Ruby. I, I know Ruby. I know Ruby. All right. I know Ruby. I just don't know. I know Ruby. Nothing just happened in the background. Okay. Uh, but um, I know Ruby. I love Ruby. Okay. Her. So, again, he's been gone a while. Yeah. Just, but um, I like Oh, yes. And then yes. one more
get it to you. River Haven Books. Mm. And I will put it on my website. Oh, yep. well, thank, thank you. you. Awesome. Oh, sure. I come. Yeah, awesome. Oh, All right. Good.